Okay. Good day, guys. This is welcome to our vlog. Here uh, we are now in our third lecture, the global economy. This is after chapter two of your book. Now here we'll be talking about the economic um, influences and forces that shape how the world works today. Okay, like in introduction, you know, the world we see now, um, in terms of this globalized world, we are so connected so much with technology, and also it's easy to travel from one place to another because of we have airplanes, so it's easy for us to go from uh, from our country to the U.S. before it takes weeks to to arrive um, with with a ship. Now we can go there for about ten hours or eight hours, or like Manila to Cebu, it takes a day. Um, like Leyte to Manila, it takes around 24 hours to arrive there. Now it's easy from Tacloban to Manila, you can travel by an hour. And also, uh, because of these technological advance advances, we can now communicate with each other even everywhere in the world and with just a click of your finger, uh, whatever device you use. And also, uh, as part of the economic globalization, a lot of products abroad are already available here in our country. And these countries, these, these companies are dominating the world in epic proportions. Uh, and sometimes these companies, as you can see here, the logos here, they work more than, any co than some countries in the world. And they are now one of the biggest forces of our, of our economy. So what is um, economic globalization? According to the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, it is the historical process as a result of human innovation and technological progress. So whatever happens in the U.S., uh, it also affects us. Because, uh, for example, if they invented the smartphone, um, it doesn't take several years before that same iPhone unit will arrive to our shores. Um, it's instantaneous because we are already connected to one another and how we ideas from other parts of the world they go here because of globalization that's one of the that's one of the advantages of this world we're living now and there are interwoven dimensions of economic globalization first is the globalization of trade goods and services so that's why products abroad are already available here. It's because of this technology through the cargo trucks, shipping lines, and even airfare. Um, I mean, air airplane. They transport goods and services from one place to another. And um, probably like just like your T-shirt you're wearing now, they prob that T-shirt traveled more places than you. Then like the raw material came from Brazil or somewhere, India or China. And then there's another country that will develop it. And then before it arrives here, it you know, it came around the world. It came around the world. And also the globalization of financial and capital market. This means to say that you can actually buy and purchase things or transfer some money from your bank account anywhere you are in the world. There you don't need and um, it's faster to do some transactions because of technology. And yes, speaking of technology, the globalization of technology and communication, which I already um, explained so much in the previous lecture we have, um, everything is fast now. With you, your fingertips has the power to control, the, to be able to communicate, and you are able to communicate and see people um, abroad because of technology. And the globalization of production, as I said in the t-shirt example, it's, it's probably uh, coming from elsewhere in the world, just like the iPhone. The accelerometer is coming from Germany, the battery is coming from China, the, the camera, the compass, the LCD screen is coming from Japan, the gyroscope is coming from Switzerland, and all this Wi-Fi chip, audio chips is coming from the US, and the distributor is something else. So, uh, you see, the iPhone itself is a global product, as much as your t-shirt is a global product, and you cannot enjoy a lot of things in the world today without this, this, without this phenomenon we call globalization. And there are two um, important terms of economic globalization, and, in, and which is in contrast in, in international internationalization. Um, globalization is this big concept that is more uh, concerned with the tran uh, qualitative transformation 
uh, functional integration between international dispersed activities, while internalization is more focused on quantitative um, change. Um, let's see, for example, globalization is, when you talk about internationalization, it's more concerned with the political lens. Uh, any any progress or any program for ever it is initiated by the state it is internationalization however if other f sectors in the society like the market like some other religious groups like some other um, other forces in the in the economy they if they participate then we are talking about globalization it's the same thing like um, in VSU, we have the internationalization standards um, for a program because we need to be calibrated with other international standards of school. And it was a state that initiated that program, so it's called interna internationalization program. But globalization is more natural. It's just going out. It's just the way it is. That's how the economy flows. And if everyone in the world is involved, then you call it globalization. Asa. Uh, claro sa lahat ng pagsulti, basa kay gobyerno kaya ni maguna una, then that's internationalization. If we talk about other forces in the economy would participate in these changes that whatever happens, that's globalization. But uh, more or less, they inter we they interchange, uh, we use them interchangeably. Basa kay more na siya bone of contention. The government, if ever, if the government, the nation states strongly initiates it. Okay, um, confluence versus divergence. Um, in many parts of the world, we see here building skyscrapers, and most likely this is when we can say na the place is developed. Kung nakana kasi building, tagas na kayo, na nasulay mga technology, and this uh, normally that's our um, that's how we understand development. It's the same thing as we see a Dubai before in 1991. Dubai was the desert; it was so scarce. And this was this only building, uh, and it's not the only building, just, we can just count how many buildings before. Now look at the same building now in 2005. And look at Dubai now. It's full of skyscrapers, they have the highest skyscraper in the world now, um, Burj Khalifa. And we like the same thing that happened in Dubai to happen in our place. Now let's, now let's look, like, uh, look at another skyscraper city. Uh, most of you were not able to guess it, but this is Manila, uh, one in Makati Center or somewhere in Ortigas. And this is Cebu. And this is, of course, Bye Bye City. And you see, there are three different modes of development, um, judging from the amount of infrastructures built and establishments and established. We can say Manila is most improved compared to Cebu, and of course, uh, Bye Bye is here is the least developed uh, place because we don't have that much uh, human structures. But um, can you uh, can you say that uh, development is something that it mimics what whatever happens in abroad? What to say? Gintabo sa gawas mo sa kano yato ang sundon. If that is the case, um, can you say that our economy is improving? Kung inanay mo itabo nato, we can say yes. At the same time, not necessarily. Because according to this um, Hollis uh, Chenery, um, this economist, in order for countries to develop surplus labor from the traditional agricultural sector, should go to the man manufacturing sector. Kinahanglan ganon ta mag industrialize. Kanika no mga maguuma nato, dilit nand mag farm. Kasi gano sa tong human resource, kinahanglan padung dito sa factories, padung dito sa mga mass produced na mga uh, job opportunities. Kaya kung dilit ko na namay tabo. Um, but we are actually now industrialized and look at the cities like Manila and Cebu mga factories mga firms and other uh, BPOs uh, business product outsourcing but still why does um, poverty still um, exist Bisan tuod na we are implementing a lot of things that will make us the same as countries abroad like the first world countries Ano mang nagkalahi na manug maayo, na nagkakita, nagkapubre yung maayo, sila nagkadato yung maayo. And these are questions that we challenge us, the, the notions of globalization. Is it something really that benefits us all? So, um, economists would further argue that 
efforts of countries to improve human, technological, and social capital are useless unless there are some major structural and at the at attitudinal and institutional reform in the world economy. Kung dili ko nausbon na itong atong mga pamaagi, like culture-wise, dili ko na mahimo na kita nang isa kong sambalaod na implement na to to, to to follow the example of the first world countries. All of them are useless unless we try to change ourselves. Kay kita ba Andres Pilipinas, family first, kita pinmi. Anya, kung na ay and ang kwarta gikan abroad but only just for the sake of development but atong mga politiko family first ang naon of course asa mapadong ang kwarta o sa gibulsa na nila and instead of uh, putting the money where it should be ato padong sa project one now compromise na atong mga infrastructure compromise atong mga programs muna this is one of the reasons why dili kita mapareha sa gawas because we are different cultural wise there must be a system that should fit us structurally so that we can enjoy the same kind of development um, other countries are enjoying. But is it really? Or is it because we are poor because they are taking advantage or, of this situation? But these are questions you need to hold on in your mind because it will make you critically think and analyze how globalization influences us and how it, takes, it shapes the world. Okay, so much with um, confluence and divergence. Let's go further and investigate um, globalization. And in the historical sense, these are different waves of economic globalization. This is just a, you know, a picture I got from the internet. Um, just given a rough draft about um, globalization. Now we will analyze globalization in a very historical perspective. And I'm inserting some lessons here, even before the age of discovery, even before the Columbian exchange. The first, um, the first um, input I will discuss in the economic globalization is what happened during prehistory. Um, some many archaeologists would suggest that there is a thing called prehistoric globalization before all this civilization sprung about before all this uh, before written text this is, this are the time when um, the stone age there was already globalization at that time and this is the main proponent see under under Stewart you know, the globalization economic globalization in prehistory was all about food particularly starch starch can be mga high complex um, carbohydrates that will give people energy to move and to do their daily needs and prehistoric globalization is all is all only you know around the eurasian continent a um, supercontinent like in arabia here in china and then uh, the Caucasus region uh, the fertile crescent mesopotamia here and all of these things india and then now uh, malaysia prehistoric um, globalization and it was all about food like in the most farmed areas in the world are mesopotamia Indus Valley civilization in the, you know, somewhere in the, in the, near the boundaries of Pakistan and India, and ancient China. This is near um, Beijing, uh, present-day Beijing, and uh, most of the commodities in Mesopotamia was wheat and barley, and then it's present in Egypt. It's also present in Europe, and it's also present in India because people from all these places, they whenever they move, they also bring their crops with them. And whenever they bring these seeds, they plant and they plant these seeds on these areas. Muna ni katagang wheat. Nabot sa China, muna na natay hopya ron, na natay shokpao, because Chinese people and can also plant their own wheat brought by the people who traveled for several years, um, bringing their crops with them. And nabot sa Asian China. And the same thing as peanuts, nabot na katag siya because of these people bringing food. Potatoes from Europe, nabot to Asia. And about the Southeast Asia, like ours, and uh, and even in Asia, we are so proud of our rice that the total kita ragi mukaon ng rice. But certain archaeological evidence would suggest that people from Asia is actually bringing rice to Africa. Na dinirapita sa sub-Saharan Africa na mga tao na mukaon ng anon. And it's, there are archaeological evidence that nabot na gidiri. And it's made possible because of prehistoric globalization. People before were traveling for several years into several miles just to transport food from one place to another. So one is siya sa prehistoric globalization. It's all about food. 
The next wave of globalization is um, the Silk Road. And there are three types of Silk Road. The Oasis Road, kung magi ka sa desert. The Steep Road, kung ari ka magi sa bukid-bukid. Ano kami mga tao na naikabayo mo, yung mga kadaga na ni. And the Maritime Road, na magi ka sa dagat. And you are using ships. The Silk Road is called the Silk Road because of the secret ingredient that is in China that is so good. And um, the silk is like a cloth that is not going to be reproduced elsewhere because it is going to be Chinese emperors at that time, ang insecreto, the silkworm. And because of their cocoon, it's, it's made into the raw material that is made of silk. That is the formaron. And silk is not the only commodity traded in the Silk Road network. Of course, there are other things traded. Uh, for example, ceramics, Chinese ceramics, and um, Chinese porcelain is part of the Silk Road. And uh, we, when we talk about the Silk Road, we are talking about thousands of years. When I say thousands of years, naabot pa diri si Alexander the Great, kaabot pa diri si Genghis Khan, and even our own Haring Humabun is part of the Silk Road. And archaeological evidence would suggest that our Visayan civilization already traded in this network of Silk Road because we got some artifacts from from the Middle East. Um, nakita tayo mga perfume, natay mga glassware, and we are actually we're, it's not necessarily na wakon ngon si Haring Umabo na niato sa lang lugar ha. It's just other foreign elements going in our shores, trading with our goods, and we are part of this Silk Road. And this is another. Uh, evidence that globalization already happened, economic globalization already happened even before the world, uh, the word globalization was invented. And the next, the next age of globalization is, uh, uh, is actually coexisting with the Silk Road. But in Europe, they practice this feudal and manorial economic system. It's a different kind of system that uh, started when peasants and they were conflicted with these barbarian raids and peasants asked for help for these nobles and the kings who offered them protection. And then, one asked, uh, and then what we give about them peasants and the king as part part of their role to protect them, and they need some food supply from the peasants. So in exchange, um, a peasant will swear their loyalty and fealty to these kings. And then, the kings will protect them, and they produce knights. And then, they are barbarians. And this is the what this is why they can explain the feudal society system that is a pyramid it co um, it sustained for several years because of the protection of the nobles to the peasants. Pero na abuse they later on said I will explain the manorial economic system. The manorial economic system um, during the Middle Ages of Europe is a structure that promoted self sustenance. Moresha ganing usaraka village nila. Uh pakaon it produced radiri. And it was the peasants that were produce the pagkaon. Lahi ang peasants sa pasture, lahi ang peasants sa farms, lahi po ang isda nila. And then there are also other people performing other roles. They, the blacksmith, they produce weapons for the war. They produce armors um, and other forms of metallurgy. And also there are the priests. Um, they, they go back and forth of some manner. There is a castle and there is a church. They are the ones inspiring the people about their hardship in life, about their sweat and brow. So this is uh, money role sa mga pare diri and also to for uh, the role of religion for social cohesion na para kwanjo sila kana magkai usa gyud pirmi and also if you might notice um, the the nobles live in a manner because every time na barbarian raid kaning tanan mga tao diri musod ni sa manner to get protected muna tag asking sila walls and then their archers will be you know range weapons sila pirmi kay kaning mga barbarian kusog mangi kini sila mo raid and mga isog pa kayo compared ani nila and then, muna, magtukos sila castle as a sign for protection and at the same time, a sign of intimidation against barbarian raiders. And of course, there are knights who will be dominating the whole manorial system if these people are paying their taxes properly or they have contributed their crops, their yield to the king. And this is how the economy of Europe functioned during the, the during the you know that what we call the, the dark ages, and uh, as you can see in Europe because in any nasi lamro conservative ka ilang structure, kuto ra po magin patak patak sila patak patak ilang kingdoms dili sila makayusa like one big country, and 
going further, uh, the decline of the feudal system, when nung wala man niya nagdugay, because of a lot of um, factors in history. Uh, for example, the Crusades, and it was precursored by Pope Urban II, because they want, um, they want to reclaim the Holy Land. So, ang iyang isulti, mga knights, sige, all knights of Europe unite. Kay kung mapil mo sa crusade, malangit mo. So, ato dito rin, kung ikaw ko na'y ganahan, ikaw ko na'y ingna na malangit ka, di ba kakamapil sa war. So, the crusade opened a lot of trading routes. Now, you remember, in a manorial system, in lahang economic system, focus ra silang mga towns. But when the crusade happened, it opened a lot of roads. And kingdoms were already connected to one another. That's one economic, uh, that's one effect of the crusades. And because of that, dili na kinahanglan ang feudal system because they can get other resources from other places opened by this um, crusade na, na mga roads, mga roads na lang yahimo. And then also, the interactions with Muslims challenged the ideal of feudalism because even it was the dark ages of Europe, um, Islam was flourishing. All of this orange area, mga Muslim na itanang rin, even, a lot of, even half, more than half of the Iberian Peninsula in uh, present-day Portugal and Spain, this was occupied by Muslims. And tumut kay mas powerful pa sila kaysa sa mga Christianos, they, now Europe is questioning whether they have actually followed the right government system. Kusakdo bang feudalism nila? So Islam, the, the presence of Muslims in the world, in, 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 in Europe, uh, even in, in the Europe world, uh, around the Mediterranean Sea, they challenge the, the existence of the feudal system. And another reason also, the Babonic Plague or the Black Plague wiped out one-third of Europe's population. And because of this rat, no, not actually the rat, it's because I mean, kuto sa ilaga, na nanda siya o sakit, na mo'y nakapatay sa one-third of population. And uh, if you are losing one-third of your human resource uh, because of the plague, of course, the economy of the feudal system will cripple. And that's why they need to adapt into a new kind of, new kind of economic system. Then enter the age of discovery. In the age of discovery, Monish yung panahon ni Christopher Columbus, ni kaabot siya sa New World, kani North America, itawag niya India, so kinagtuho siya nasa sa India. And then, um, during the age of discovery, ang mga, ang mga tao sa Europe, mahadlok sila mo ari padung kuan, padung east, kay na may Ottoman Empire na mga Muslim, kay mutabok sila diri, iha posible na ihawan sila, kay napamani sila ika na kaligot ko tungkol sa Crusades, kay because the Crusades invaded their lands. Before the Crusades, uh, Muslims and Christians uh, live in some relative peace. Wala pa na siya concept of jihad kaayo, pa ka na siya gi, gi, wala pa siya matuman. But because of the Crusades, muna nag-away-away na ni Ron. And dila, dila sa katabok. And during the age of discovery, ang um, Ang spice, they, it's called black gold, na mas mahal pa siya sa actual gold. Mas mahal pa ang mga lamas. And the, the best way to get rich at that time is you have the control of the spice roads. Pero block ang ilahang spice roads because of the Ottoman Empire. The only way to get to the east is through the, by the sea. And when I say by the sea, na ay kitawag na spice islands, which is now in present day Indonesia, uh, just south of the Philippines. And the only way to get there is boat. Unya, karon, there are two dominating powers, Spain and Portugal. These are the, the, the emblems of Spain and Portugal at that time. Unya, maglalis sila, kisa asa mong isla pa doon. Kaya human, ilang itawag pag sa Tupapa na mahusay ilang conflict si Pope Alexander VI. And then, moto si Pope Alexander VI, asya, I will draw a line, diri sa kalibutan. Um, anything, um, anything left will belong to Spain, anything right will belong to Portugal. Hey, um, human kay naglibog na Spain, oh, di siya kato sa Spice Island, kay ang Spice Island at that time, the only available road is going east. They were not uh, aware na pwede di ay padung sa west na mabot sa, mabot sa Spice Islands. Motong, enter si but Ferdinand Magellan. Kay kung ama Spanish, ma rival man nilang Portugal, kung maagi sila di rin, sila kaagi kay, kung 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 Unya, suko ang Portug Portugal. Nga naman, Portuguese man si Ferdinand Magellan. Unya, si Ferdinand Magellan, suko masat siya sa Portugal. Kaya nananghid siya na muadri sa east, uh, westward, katawaan man siya sa Portugal. Mutong, ato siya nananghid sa hari sa Spain. 
Niya ang Spain, looking at it as another opportunity to take off na mas mulabaw pa siya sa Portugal, tagaan niya og mga barko si, si Magellan, tagaan niya og fleet, tagaan niya og crew. Moto na itabo, si Magellan, ang iyang crew, mo ay first na, na, first na naval crew na naka-circumnavigate sa kalibutan. And it was because of this guy, and niya ang contribution sa modern world, na ang Spanish Empire na abo sa Philippines, despite the Treaty of Saragossa. Now, um, in the age of discovery, nagitawag na Colombian leg change. Before, ang corn nara na sa North America and wheat is only existing in the old world in Eurasia and Africa. Because of the Colombian leg change, we have food now um, in other parts of the world. Mo sa US, nasa like Coco Crunch, kita nag-enjoy po the cornflakes. It's because of the product of the age of discovery. And you can see a lot of um, vegetables that we have and even livestock na abot Nabot sa North America, ila po mga pagkaon, nabot po sa tua. Even as kaning tabako, kaning kuan, even ang kaning pabo, kalabasa, pineapple, cacao, wala tayo chocolate, wala ni siyang age of discovery. And even in, in, even in America, wala sila honey, wala sila banana, wala sila olive, wala sila kape. And wala sila yung mga sakit dito sa una, kay, um, diseases is one of, the more, uh, one of the most effective weapons against the natives in the Northern America at that time. Wala, dili ni may tabo kung wala ang age of discovery. And this is, um, in fact, na ang globalization sa una goes overseas before it's only food, it's only among the kanil mga knights na to travel by horses. Karon, dili na ang mga, um, mga ship vessels and mga, mga galleons but would um, actually be the precursor in how, how to operate all this age of discovery and globalization at this time. Now, we'll, let's talk about World War I because it has a very big effect in terms of globalization um, how the, why the world operates the way today. And do you know how the World War I started? It's because kaning uh, panang sa Europe na 1914, mura nang mga silinga na nagkuwat nagbikil tanan ba? Sige, they hate each other, like the France and Germany, they hate each other because they want to get some land they feel that belongs to them. And even in, in, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, they hate each other. And then, like, about the Bikel, the Franz Ferdinand, or the Archduke of Austria, visited uh, Serbia. Uh, visited Serbia. And then Serbia, at that time, and, um, they want the Austro-Hungary nation na iyuntang na ilang influence ilang country. Muna niya ni ang Serbia na, and ang uh, nagusak katao sa Serbia. Iyang gipatay ni si Franz Ferdinand. And so ko kayong Austro-Hungary. Serbia, you did this. And then, ang Serb uh, and then because um, nanay Bikil, Austro-Hungary um, asked for this friend, um, Germany, kay allies man sila, and ang um, mag-declare sila war against Serbia. And Serbia, and then Germany agreed, oh cool, sige, after tagpagira ta. Serbia is the, kalmara kay Serbia, kay naman siya allies. Ang France o ang Russia. France and Russia and uh, Serbia, muna siya kitawag ang Triple Alliance during the World War I and Double Alliance Germany and Austria Hungary. And during that time, na sila rontay magira, na mga countries na mo declare neutral ra sila, like the UK, dislaganan mo pil. And Belgium also wanted to be neutral. However, Germany, war freak po kayo, iyang yapil apil ang Belgium. Kaya nga naman, Nirida pita sa France, there's a major line of defense na wa mag-expect ang Germany na naadit yung dipinsa diri. Kaya ang plano sa Germany, ilang una invade ang France, after nilag invade sa France, ilang troops, ilang kwaon, ilang ibutan dito sa Russia. In, kaya kibama sa lang Russia, iya-iyak na panahon sa gira. Pero wa lang expect na prepared kay Germany. That's why they invaded Belgium para mutuyok sila sa Belgium and then they could attack France. And tungod kay ilang gitaki ang Belgium na supposedly neutral unta, suko ng UK. Muna ang UK, ni appeal na siya sa gira. And UK, um, UK has an ally um, across the Atlantic Ocean, which is the US. And they invited the US na mo appeal sa gira. Pero ang US wanted to remain neutral. Kaya nga naman, US is a country of immigrants. Nasa lay mga tao gikan sa Germany, nasa lay tao gikan sa Serbia, gikan sa France, gikan sa UK. And if ever nasa lay labanan o any European country na ilang labanan, magka-civil war ang US. Moto ang US, ah sige neutral lang ko. Pero, I can sell you weapons. 
mura na ilang part main participation sa US during World War I. So, ang gibuha sa US na maligya sila mga armas, ilang tagag-armasan na hala sige, pagira mo dira, nagaan nilag pusil, 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 pusil. And yeah, in exchange, all of these countries in Europe, in exchange for weapons, they are paying gold to the US. Ta-ching, ta-ching. And then, this when US started their war freak na attitude. Eh, para nila, because of the effect of World War I, na dato silag mayo. And for them, war is good. And because after World War I, this is when the US becomes the richest economy in, in the planet. And what did the US do with their gold? And let's discuss in the next slide. Um, before before we talk about how the US do did with the gold size US ilang gold, we talk about um, gold standard. And let's talk about the history of money 101. Before there was gold, before we have paper money, it was only the barter system. Imong uh, people directly exchange things like imong you know, exchange of bread, the gaan of wheat or in exchange of livestock, something like that, uh, barter. After the barter system, there's the token system, that there's gold corresponding to amount of value, na may more represent of value, and then there's the rec, like bronze, silver, and anang, um, bronze, silver, and gold. And what is it na gold standard? You use gold directly to pay something. You use a token or any shiny metal to, to trade for some goods. And then, after gold standard, na nayapot na mga paper money or money siya gitawag bank notes. Yes, it's very inconvenient when you are trading a lot of gold tokens. It's very heavy and it's very hard to transport. Muna ang mga gold, bilin na sa mga banks, badong sa banko. And para iba ibaw, ano na kay kwarta sa banko, muna gitawag paper money. It's like IOU. Um, you have 1,000 pesos, it means to say you have 1,000 pesos. Uh, corresponding to the gold in that bank, this is called the gold standard exchange, which I will explain later on. And then after paper money, we have e-money in the form of credit cards that you have this, you can make trans transaction faster because of credit. And after credit cards, probably cryptocurrency or like all of this Bitcoin, Ethereum, I, I don't know, really. It's still a bother a question whether blockchain technology would actually revolutionize how we think about money. But before this, um, let's talk about the effect of the World War One to the U.S. Um, after World War One, the dato on U.S. na sila the kang gold. Ito sila madato sila mayo. But what will happen if we, we review the basic economic na laws, law of supply and demand? Nidagka ng supply ng gold, what will happen to the value of uh, dollar? Nigamay siya. And because of that, uh, one, this is after the effect after the World War, it's one of the contributions why na a Great Depression na itabo sa US. Aside from all this economic na mga um, historical antecedents na itabo dito, kaning, um, kaning na itabo sa US na nidako ang dagka sila gold, ay lang gold, mura nagway value at all. However, na ay other opportunity ang US na maka-recover sila. Here comes World War II. Boom. And alam sa this, sa gira na gani, US mga kita ginagpaagi na makabintaha sila. O, ito, na na pa US. Okay, um, now we will not be talking about World War II yet. I will reserve that to another topic. But fast forward World War II, let's talk about Bretton Woods Agreement. In the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, there are 44 allied countries in the world and yet then to discuss economic matters after World War II. Okay, every economy is crumbling man after the war. And uh, Monisha, the kind of mga, 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 mga dato, mga elite sa Bisayasang Kalibutan, naghatak sila mga representative ni ato sila sa Bretton Woods, which is in New Hampshire in the U.S. And trivia, the Philippines is part of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Our representative is Andres Soriano. Eh, Andres Ariano is the reason why uh, San Miguel now is very big. Andres Ariano is also the founders, the found, one of the founders of Philippine Airlines. And if you're familiar with Atlas Mining Corporation in Cebu, siya po nagsugod, siya po nagsugod ani. Muna ang barangay Lutupan, uh, one of his official name is Barangay Don Andres Ariano. It's because of this guy and si siya po kay siya may usas pinakadatos Pilipinas on na siya gipada dito sa Bretton Woods Agreement. In the Bretton Woods Agreement, natay gitawag na Keynesian wave of uh, economics. 
and um, um, because the chart three goals of a Bretton Woods agreement, macroeconomic stability, import substitution, government reform. And see si John Maynard Keynes um, is the British delegate that government should play an active role in the economy by lending from financial institutions. Si John Minard Keys, money siya ang um, delegate sa, Brit, um, uh, sa British, um, British Empire at the moment. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the effects of the Bretton Woods Agreement is the establishment of this um, global economic organization such as the IMF, the IBRD, or the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Money na siya ang World Bank karun. And also the GITT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. This is the World Trade Organization today. And of course, uh, ang tumong anin tanan, para daw maka-recover ang mga economies sa kalibutan sa una, pautang kananglan ang mga govern governments mangutang sa gobyerno para na sila ikigasto sa ilang mga repairs, sa ilang sa mga nasod. And then in exchange, Ang uh, goan ang uh, US or kaning mga kaning mga global economic organizations na sila demands uh, na sila mga conditions sa dili aron makautang ang uh, mga mga nation states and of course na conditions diri ta magsugod and we will talk about usa man ni mga possibly na mga effects ay ba man siya kita wag ni ingon si kuan ingon si Maynard Keynes na kung mangutang ang gobyerno they will uh, the economic the economy will improve kaya ay mga investments may tabo. Uh, let's talk about that later on. Now, let's talk about macroeconomic stability. Um, after World War II, guba yun kayo, a majority of the world, except for the U.S. A U.S. may nakabintaha, kaya gira, wala mo abot sa ilang lugar. And then, countries like um, Germany, Japan, United Kingdom, and of course, our own Philippines, kita po, devastated po after the war. And then, of course, to guba ang yung lugar sa kuan, magproblema lagi kaya patay asa mangita mangita pang repair ni. And then enters the US. O sige, pangutang, patangunta mo. Manya, okay ang Japan, okay ang kuan, UK. Manya, ano World Bank. But you need to be a member, uh, you need to be members of the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and now the World Trade Organization, para makautang ang mga countries. And then, Niba nakabayad ang Germany's lang utang, nagbayad-bayad na po ng Japan, nibayad na po ng UK. Unfortunately, ang 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 Pilipinas kita na nangutang po sa World Bank, wala ta makabayad. O di kita makabayad, kay pobre man ta, di man ta parayan hindi la to lo. Kaya uh, ni sila mga assets po. So, the World Trade Organization would say, oh, it's fine as long as our we can do business in our country without tax." Muna siya mga conditions para sige wa makakabayad sa utang sige maghibot-bot ni condition pwede mi maras yung nasod na walay bayad tax ay mga holidays na ay mga kana dilik makapaka bypass mi siyang mabalaod na will protect your economy and whenever we go to your country pareha lang competition with local na mga businesses and we will talk about about that now we talk about the gold exchange standard um, the gold standard is when you use gold directly in to buy, purchase goods, and exchange goods. The gold standard, money is you give ang gold with a particular currency. Let's say it's one of the agreement of the Breton, one of the effects of the Breton Wood Agreement. Okay, ang one ounce of gold equals thirty-five dollars, mapunting value. And we say gold exchange standard fixed na na value. So the more gold you have in your bank, the more you, gold you have in your national treasury, the stronger is your currency. And muna siya ay um, gold standard. And then, nagkinahinin na ko ang recover ang mga nations at states sa una, like Japan, Germany, and the UK, after they recover the war, and they find out their products are better than um, the US products, like uh, mga Toyota, mga sakinan sa Japan, kay mas fuel efficient man siya compared sa mga sakinan sa US. And then even Americans themselves would buy Toyota rather than the US Ford or General Motors nila na mga sakinan. And even Germany, naka-recover naka na after the war because naman sila yung mga values and work ethics that could help their economy improve. And 
Ang duduhan na ang Germany, sige ba may bayad sa mga utang? Sure ka, napakay gold dira. So, actually, nagkabalak ang US. O, oh, napakay. Pero tinutuan na, sige, print o kwarta ang US. Bisan, wala na yung gold na kadiplit na kay nagsige mag uh, convert ang kanilang mga nation states of gold nila sa US. Ilang kwarta, ilang in-exchange of gold. And then, nagduda na ang UK kung nabagay gold pa ang US sa ilang hang economy. And then, UK, napos lagihin mo ng mga underground movement na to the point na ang UK pound is worth better, um, worth higher than the US dollar. And then, actually, nag nakubaan na ng US. And na, muna na, napugos na si Richard Nixon, the president of the US after that time. E siya agay, mas action na yun. Mura mag mas kulba na siya ba kay ang currency sa uban nasod sa especially European countries na naka-recover after the war. Mas ni kuan ba, mas, mas ni sukul na sa dollar. Motong, ilang gyo sa mga game play. Sa undangon ta ni. Pagtang gumpo na natin ng gold exchange standard. Kaya kansin na ta. Motto, after the gold standard, we have the fiat currency. And this is the current economic system we are now. A fiat currency, now, ingat si Dix, um, President Nixon, na uh, this is no longer convertible to gold. Muna na meeting sila diri sa mga G10 nations. Muna mga G10 nations, si uh, Netherlands, Italy, France, Germany, Japan, Switzerland, the US, Canada, UK, Sweden, and Belgium. Ang meeting sila, napura mga drug group of 10 countries, kasi sila naman po yung mga datos kalibutan, kasi sila yung magbuot-buot as if mga hilason kayo mga kanilang mga nasura. There is a Masonian agreement of 1971, and during the Masonian currency no longer depend on gold or any um, other shiny metal. The value of economy now depends on the economic strength of each nation. So, dire naibdan og tunok ang US, di na gisla malugi, kaya ang ilahang kwarta, di na magdipindi kung how much gold they have. Kasi sige mas nagprint ang kwarta na ang gold nila na wala man mo usos, eh wala man mo usbong. Pero muna makagamay ang value sa dollar. Motong, uh, karoon ilang i-declare after the fiat currency na agreement uh, that every currency in the world is now floating. Mag-usap-usap ang value sa currency depende kung nung sa ka-strong ang iyang economy. Let, let's explain the fiat currency how it works. Let's say one dollar equals uh, 50 0.76 pesos. Pero kanang value sa Osaka, $1 sa itong economy, mag-usab-usab na siya. It's either magtaas ang value sa peso or value mo ubos. It depends on the economic factors of how the demand, supply and demand in the economy would work. And how to improve the economy of the peso? Um, it's actually through current exchange, like kung ay mga napa-exchange of dollars diri sa itong naso than exchange of peso, the more people using the peso, the more value the peso has. And also the PPO industry, anything that will, de anything, any deal we have with abroad, like kaning mga, na may mga foreign clients na maridiri, mukuha o kanang local talents na to for call centers, and mas barato man tong labor diri, in exchange, bubayad na clients na to, and technology is making it possible na diri na ang mga trabahante for them, naman ang kuhaan kaning maka-income ang nasod, and the, the value of the peso will improve. Also, yeah, the remittances we have from OFWs, ang mga kwarta na ipada sa ito ang mga pamilya dito abroad, padon diri, in exchange ani, mo improve atong economy. Kay gikan man sa outside sa country, na ipadong sa tua. And that's remittances. Uh, remittances of OFWs improve our economy. It's the same thing as tourism. Kung sila mismo mga langyaw, maari sa tonasod, ania, mugasto sila sa tonasod, then it will improve the economy there are new money coming in and will and their new peso will be circulating in our country and the more money we spend in our country the more um, the more strength for our currency and our economy will improve so um, saving is not actually a quite um, let's say uh, it's a quite counterintuitive although it's good to save personally uh, for your personal benefit it's safe land pero isad maayo na magsigil rapot at safe tenan ang pagagastador na to is actually um, prevalent um, proliferating our economy and that's actually healthy for the economy kung nagkang gasto now let's talk about the Asian financial crisis of 1997 so that we can know what's the role of these global economic organizations so in Southeast Asia nagsugod na Asian crisis sa Thailand Kaya Thailand, like many other Southeast Asian nations before, they want to they want to attract more foreign investments, and then 
ni is okay ang Quran Indonesia, okay po ta, Pilipinas. Yeah, okay ra po ang Korea, okay kayo. Anya, after they see na, na ay mga attractants from foreign investors, they say, oh, looking good to invest in Asia. Heart emoticon. And then, oh, I will invest $500 billion. Anya, uh, pag invest ng $500 million, ni, ni boom ang real estate market sa Thailand. After sa real estate market, nakuyawan ang Thailand kay ang mga tao na ilang ipa, gipapalit sa real estate which is in, in in the form of that pili makabayad sila mga utang and then ni actual kabalaka ang mga foreign investors this is not only the US uh, this is actually a group of foreign nations na ni invest sa Southeast Asia motong ilang gi withdraw ilang gi pull out tanan nila mga kuan 500 by 105 billion dollars pag pull out nila sa kwarta nagubak ang economy sa Southeast Asia and there's domino effect Tanan mga nations sa Southeast Asia is affected by this pulling out of the money. Motog, damay ang Indonesia, damay ang South, East Asia, uh, South Korea, kuya, down gito ng crisis, ay nang kwanto, ekonomiya to. And of course, Philippines, we are also affected, but, you know, as Pinoy, okay, raba sa, di lang ako magbong. And then, here comes all my, the joke metaw, this is, here comes the IMF. Ang IMF saved the day because they bail out um, the the Southeast um, Asian financial crisis. Ilang gi, ilang gi, gi help, um, ilang gi bail out, means to say, uh, ilang gi stab, to help stabilize the economy, um, ilang gi pam, ilang taga kwarta ni mga nation states. And of course, it's a form of loans. So, you know, na, pasa utang gani, na nagin mga demands. So, you better be careful every time. And uh, let's talk about import substitution because it is one of the goals for in order for um, economic industries to improve. And kani mga nation states like um, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, now these are Latin countries, um, uh, they improved their economy because they were able to produce their own industrial goods. When asalamadilis laying on mo supply sa raw materials to other nations. Instead, they are using their own raw materials so that they can produce their products. Well, na ngani mga countries, they cannot, they don't like to import um, cars like Ford going to their country, okay? Because they can make their own car. The mat uh, matresa of Mexico, and um, matresa of Mexico is if they for them, uh, matreta de matreta of Mexico for them is better than the, the any other foreign car. And it's the same thing like, you know, Brazil, they're so proud with their Havaianas. Um, they are one of the leading producers of rubber in the world. And Havaianas is a very world-renowned uh, brand. And they're so proud of it. And look at Buenos Aires now. It's so developed to the extent now Buenos Aires already has a Pope, the first Pope outside of Europe, and then the post Pope in South America. And to be able to achieve in the level of world leadership, it means to say that this country, these countries are now developing faster. And it's because they uh, they were able to substitute their import needs with domestic industries that they have now in their country. Because Argentina now is becoming a tech hub in the modern world. Meanwhile, meanwhile in the, in the Philippines, and like, you know, what's happening? Let's, let's just imagine that we have a conversation with the US I guess I want to be a agricultural country. Okay. I want to change my mind. I want to get industrialized now. Okay. I don't have money. Don't worry. I then enter the World Bank. I will lend you some money. And after lending some money, we have programs like the Four Peace. And then, uh, of course, it's actually helping a lot of people. Okay, the kanke yung tao below poverty line. Na nakapaskwila na silang mga anak na nasa pang allowance, na nasa pang snacks, silang food, sa kana, na nasa ilang pang kaon, and every day, kaya because of it, kinagkaman kayo mga sudyante, na dili makaskwila, kaya what's lay down? And because of a four-piece, katong mga, mga, mga pamilya na na-upgrade na sa programa sa four-piece, um, nakabintahan na sila, pwede na sila makasaka sa social ladder. And, uh, but, you know, this is utang ra. And then sometimes, in our country, will pay once we, we actually reap the fruits of economic development after this um, programs would proliferate. Pero magdibog ta, is, is it really a good thing na mangutang ni Tapirmi? 
probably we can say no. If we say, di magin maayo mo ta permit kaya kan sita kay mo demand na ni mga ubang countries o sa iba hatong nila, pwede sila kaman nirmandar. Kaya of course, kung utangan ka, di sa pwede mo supak nila. Kaya pura bag, ah, ikaw pa'y nangutang, ikaw pa'y supakiro kayo. Pero, hunahunahon po nato, kung di lipod mga utang ang Pilipinas, we don't have projects like the VSU. VSU, this university that you're in and studying now, is actually a product of all of these um, loans. This is a this is a World Bank project. The VSU, the Visaya State University of Visca at that time, was part of the World Bank mission. If wala mangutang ang Pilipinas, dilit ni matukod ang VSU. So you have to think twice. It's a very complicated situation. Whether if we can say nang sayup ang mangutang ang Pilipinas or di, or, or else we we would not be enjoying the things that we are our country is enjoying now. The fact that you are able to watch this explainer video in YouTube and you were able to listen to my lecture even after the class outside the classroom, it means to say that the technology of the U.S. reached us. Nabut sa tua, so we have to think twice. Dilita po hindi po tuwang kontra po pirmi because nafi mga benefits, but we just have to be vigilant all the time. And as much as we can thank all these um, global economic organizations like the World Bank or like the the IMF, we have also to to know that. You know, there are other people who are also taking advantage kasi kanin mga mga buaya sa tong Congreso. Dili magud padung sa World Bank tan na, di magud padung sa project tan na tong mga budget. Of course naman ipadungan ni mga kahit man ni percentage mga kagwang. Oh niya, kanang dili ta kabay sa utang. Siya okay lang, let's just do business in our country for free. Kasi dili kwedi sila mo so diri, they can sometimes they can ignore economic um laws. Makamat mi kamina sila. They can get our raw materials, and we cannot say anything back because, um, okay, we can say anything back. It's a man ta, and we just agree on the terms and agreement. Because, but we are hurting deep inside. Kibaw tao sa ganon tao sa tunasod, but we cannot do anything about it because we are already trapped by this economic system in a global scale. Now, mo na niya structure karon, but it's complicated. And they have to think how we should actually work on this. Because this is the current system we are now. And the US um, and all other first world countries, they might say, no, sa may mabuhat na to, that's the order. This is the world order now. And then um, all these loans, all these um, financial aids, um, the, these first world countries are thinking that it's actually help for us. But is it really? Just hold that question in your mind. Because it's one of the things that you need to think critically how, in how you analyze this global order we have now. And these are some um, statements of the World Bank about structural adjustments. Because every time dilita makabaya sa utang, and every time mangutang ta, naagin mga conditions on World Bank. Like the guarantee for official discipline, the curve budget deficits, mo ng goal para dilik mga kwan, kinang mugamay daw mga utang. Pero dilik mo bayit yung firmi, like mingita ko na tag fiscal plan para mabayaran yun ng utang and then the reduction of fund public investiture like military and public administration kaya of course yung mag-invest at itong military makadlock na ng US matratan na ng authority kaya kung nata yung nuclear for example di man yung makasayon-sayon ng mga first world countries pero kung it's one of the conditions kailangan kung may force lang pa utang kailangan mo pirmata na dilita mo invest sa itong military because of course if they have we have a strong military they can just cannot they just cannot control us in a month a strong military uh, stronghold and then tax reform aiming at the creation of effective enforcement of course this is one given hey they need to be sure na mabayran sila financial liberation with interest rate determined by the market uh, they want the government to have less intervention within our economy and competitive exchange to assist uh, export led, led growth. So uh, it's actually na mga balaw to gihimo that will benefit more sa mga countries outside the Philippines. And trade liberation coupled with abolition of imposing licensing and reduction of tariff. So mga countries uh, abroad, it's because we signed the World Bank Agreement, they can easily enter our country. Now what's by bayad? Why is le by taripa? And of course, the promotion of foreign direct investments. Um, they want to promote foreign products like McDo. They want it to be promoted equally as our Jollibee. And 
Usa ko mapag-compete sa itong local na mga businesses kung ang ngayon dagko ng mga companies abroad mo so diri. And they want um, same fair competition. Usa ko mapaglambot sa itong local economy yana. And these are one of the conditions of structural adjustments na ito diri. And privatization of um, state enterprises. Kaya kung no, um, the kind ka ayo o mga GOCCs like government-owned na mga companies and one of the things na i conditions na para mapirmahan ng atong mga ut kung utang ta sa sa mga global economic organization is to privatize a lot of companies like all of this um, electronic company Veco, Meco, Leeco, na na um, kaya mga water company even like Philippine Airlines for example was owned by the government after it was privatized it was owned by Lusitan and all these other succeeding na mga oligarchs. Uh, na usab ng structure sa company what will happen to my privatized uh, lot, a lot of uh, benefits that government employees should be in, which should be in, enjoying dili na ma enjoy sa current employees ani na mga companies and mo ni mga privatization na mga investments na kay mga tabo and deregulation of the economy let's say for example the deregulation of the oil law before ang gobyerno pwede siya maka set of price ceiling sa presyo sa gasolina like aray lagi kuto pa mo na mga oil company sa una masigi sila kumpit na pagpagamay na yung presyo sa oil karon itangtang naman ang limit sa price ceiling kay deregulate naman siya mo na ang mga oil run tira pa sa kapatas anay na sila mga presyo and we cannot do anything but it's also a complicated if, if we don't deregulate the economy like for example in the case of oil if we don't deregulate it wala na tayo daghang kasultahan sa to ang nasod and we do, if we don't have that much fuel for our, our in, a, in a, within our country there will be so much problem in terms of transportation in terms of transporting goods from one place to another and that's why it's actually a very tough dilemma for our political leaders at that time whether to sign the loans from World Bank and um, the IMF and of course protection of property rights sometimes gani kung mga lugi gani ang mga foreign companies na gani usahay na ang gobyerno mo mo bayad naman na sila ay tawag na eh, royalty, uh, royalty fee I just forgot the term basta kay na system na kuan uh, sover, sovereign, sovereign rights or something uh, every time malugi like moral ko malugi pa bayro ng gobyerno so you have to think about that every time na utang ang uh, gobyerno na to every time na project uh, we just cannot afford it ang mo fund na mga yan eh, mga foreign firms and investments and naan na ginay kapilit and it's because of this mga trap dub trap na we cannot uh, prosper for we cannot do what we want we, we have to follow the mandates of these first world nations and sometimes if you use conflict theory as a lens to analyze this um, this world bank institu the, the institutions like the world bank the IMF the world trade organizations these are used to as an instrument to control uh, third world countries like ours now we talk about the neoliberal wave and this is when uh, we propagate the lazy fair principle na government mo kuan you know, uh, should not intervene at all because uh, according to economists like Joseph Stiglitz uh, neoliberal doctrine is more of freedom of cessation kan digig kuno ta mo digig kuno mo intervene ang government or whatever the market um, does kinahanglan mo flow ra gi kuno ang market uh, because it's that's the only way we can attain prosperity uh, among that will trickle down from the elite to the lower classes and of course what's happening in the world mature world countries mo rekambo gina di gina may tabo sa balay kamo ra may nadato kami na pupri sa mot but let's explain first the trickle down principle trickle now let's explain the trickle down effect and this is one of the main doctrines of uh, neoliberalism let's say the philippines uh, uh, ask for a loan for from the the world trade organization i mean from the world bank or the imf okay let foreign companies operate in your country freely so, okay and then the country borrow money from geos and in the condition that companies can operate without much regulation so we we'll trickle down siya well, let's say that's lay this is the nestle company in tanawan uh, batangas and then foreign companies provide labor to local so na effect na good effect na matrabaho ang mga tao they can work in factories and then now locals have jobs and therefore they can pay taxes. Pwede na sa tax and na kwarta ng gobyerno. 
And sometimes when people have money, they can also make their own businesses. They can send their money and they can send their children to school. And when their children go to school, they become professionals and they can earn more income and in exchange. And later on, hopefully, there will be economic prosperity and everyone will be happy. And then, and what kind of effect? And mo kana na siya goal of neoliberalism. Pasagdar ng ginana to market na mo floro siya ginaiyaha. If it it goes back to the, the invincible hand principle of Adam Smith, that the the the, the market should be lazy fair, that the capitalist system is self-correcting, and the government should be should hands off uh, with any economic transactions in the economy in any any economic transactions. Kasi kung nak mo mo maghilabot ko ng gobyerno sa market, nagi ko na ibati na may tabo. But is it really what's happening? Uh, trickle, according to neoliberalists, trickle-down economics is just like this. Mupur kag wines sa osar sa top sa pyramid, it will trickle down and everyone will benefit. But what actually happens? Mutang ka diri wine, nakadako ang baso, nakadako ang baso, ngayon ka diri, nakadato sa lagmayo, ang mga nasubos, nagapubreg sa mot. That is why we need to be critical whether is it something that we need to accept as gospel truth. And neoliberalism is one of the present ideologies that is so prevalent in the world. Nato lang gitawat na okay rana basa badato lang ta. And sigla tapang pangutang pangutang pangutan. And we don't are we are not really aware that maybe there's a lot of entities in the world who are taking advantage of us. And of course, the power of transnational corporation. And there are four different types of personal corporation: the international companies multinational companies, global companies, and transnational companies. International companies, mo nai silang nai silay, na silay produkto sa gawas, pero they only they don't directly invest in a country. They just sell their products abroad, like Lamborghini, for example, or some other exotic na mga shops. Mo nai may examples sa international companies. Multinational companies do not have coordinated products or offerings in each country, but they're focused on adopting their products and services. Mo na magdo dere. Kung matok ang magdo sa gawas, dagko kay burger. Inya ikabot tiri dagmay na burger kay dagmay ko na tagaon. Mo kana na ingon. But I mean now, they they sometimes they 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 change the the recipe, they change the formula of their food to adapt to the local market. Mo like for example, is is McDonald lahi ilang slogan dito kita. We have love ko tao. And that's uh, McDonald's is one of the. It was one of the multinational companies. Global companies are those. Now, when say recipe dito sa gawas, what are their products abroad? It's also the same product they 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 sell in our country. They sell in the third world countries. A good example is Coca Cola. When say formula of Coke dito sa gawas, it's the same formula as here. That's why Coke is a global company. And then, transnational companies are those companies who have a centralized system of uh, business operations like Microsoft. Ang ilang research and development na dito sa US concentrated. And then they have uh, marketing powers in markets as Leo Pasinas among countries. But anything that is new about Microsoft, dito siya. Usually, mga technology sector mo ay mga transnational companies like Apple. Na dili na pwede nila ipasalik sa pikas na nations like mag franchise o mga nations sa ilang mga products. They have to centralize it because anything that happens, um, kani mga technocrats may mga manubag. And there are three fundamental innovations uh, about change in the character of corporations: the digitalization of instantaneous um, communication, the letter kayo, and of course, uh, what's in now the structural competition of community chain and the increasing form of global system. Before it, we have to transact directly from money. Karon dali na kayo, computer to computer, we can now uh, we change the character of globalization and then even just a single second can make so much difference with the world economy, with the global economy we have. So, um, in this lecture, uh, you learn the following things. Define the economic globalization and internalization with different sources. As you've noticed, we, we talk about history, we talk about technology, we talk about politics, we talk about war, we talk about ideology, we talk about economics. And in order to understand economic globalization, we have to cater to all of these uh, lenses so that we have a very multifaceted understanding on how the world works. And also, we identified different historical antecedents and technological breakthroughs uh, laid the foundations of economic globalization. 
as you know, if you remember it, um, we started from the pre prehistory and then we go to the Silk Road and then we explain a bit about uh, the feudal and manorial system of Europe and after which we explain the decline of the feudal system which gave the way to the, the, the rise of the age of discovery. After the age of discovery, they have the Colombian exchange and then we talk about the World War One, and the World War One is making the U.S. The, the richest country in the world. And how did they go? And because of this um, historical events, monang inani ang economic um, economic na make up from sa kalibutan. And then we are able to determine the result of economic globalization. Ito ma early wave Indian economics. And monay karon na inani ang structure kung kalibutan. Monay na mga dato ng first world kita first first world is because of these historical events and nakabintahak lang din sila kay naaslay technology that will dominate all other countries in the world and if and because they can impose these things like pautang nila and maglibog ta kung kita na sa third world usa may boto na to kung dili ta mangutang dili ta ka repair sa tuang mga damage sa war kung mangutang ta na nasila nasila katungod na magdimad magmando kun sa ilang ganahan so this is very complicated we can just rally around the streets and say, shout oh, against imperialism, but we can never really be sure because we are actually enjoying the effects of globalization. So you have to be critical now as a global citizen. What will you do now that you know this economic structure in any good? It's very unequal. Well, what where as a lugar? So you you have to ask questions on your mind as a global citizen, and you need to know to imagine the future as a kapadong. So this will be our lecture today. That would be all. This is a very long topic. And if you have some questions, ask me personally, ask me in a Google Classroom, or leave a like and a com uh, please leave a like and or a comment below if you have some questions. And I will be happy to entertain you. Bye-bye.